Okay, so today we will talk about shape generation in our digital geometry processing class. Uh, last week we dealt with a related topic, uh, another generation topic. It was about uh, putting polygonal meshes to scalar fields. Uh, and it was used in the scientific visualization application of medical image viewing, for instance. Uh, today we will see a totally different approach to generate these shapes or the discrete versions, the meshes. Uh, it will be based on growing a set of seed shapes or learning a shape space and uh, processing it accordingly. And in the end, I will also show a totally different approach called Shape from X. Uh, so the growing part is about shuffling and deforming a set of seed meshes. Uh, in a consistent way through uh, some kind of optimization tool. Uh, a genetic algorithm has been used, for instance, in this paper to that end. Uh, so it is that. But today I will focus on this algebraic approach based on principal component analysis PCA. Uh, and this picture may be familiar because in our video games, like NBA, FIFA, we have seen the sliders and we played with them to create new players uh, and basically they have done this by learning the shape space and then uh, attaching uh, this semantic attributes to there uh, so we will learn basically how to do this today if we don't lose our focus uh, so PCA is about uh, this dimension dimensionality reduction uh, and with less and more meaningful dimensions it will be easier to process the data in it basically let me put it that way in the very beginning at least so for instance in this data set the variation is apparently on the heights so once I learn this I can create taller or shorter guys automatically because uh, it is the only variation apparently here so uh, the bad news is I cannot create a sitting guy or a jumping woman, etc. because the variation is not in the pose or in the gender. So we should live with it. Uh, with, with one variety, variety comes uh, better, uh, more flexible reconstructions. Uh, however, learning the variety in this domain is difficult, more difficult, but once you do it, you will be able to synthesize new poses as well. So PCA is a tool uh, that helps me to learn this variety, uh, to represent it through principal components, principal directions or variations. So it discovers direction, directions among which data has big variation. Uh, and in particular, our data will be shapes, like every dot here will be a, a person, like uh, a guy, another guy, a girl, etc. So, um, and each person will be basically represented with many points, like 1000 vertices. Then, basically, what you see in 2D here will be a very higher dimension. In the end, like 3000 dimensional domains we will be talking about, but luckily we will reduce those dimensions to a manageable amount and we will manage it basically. So let's get motivated about this PCA business. Uh, line fit, plane fit can be done with PCA easily, uh, like in this data set of 2D points. Once I get this red direction, the this will be the line basically that I am looking for. Uh, or another interesting application is OBB oriented bonding box computation. So here is a regular axis aligned bonding box where I am restricted with vertical and horizontal uh, cutoffs for my bonding box. But here it is totally arbitrary, so it is better actually. Uh, <clears throat> So it is not maybe very clear in this domain, in this example, unfortunately, but let's look at this data, data set. So the, let's do some drawing here. Hopefully I can do it pen. Okay. So 
the access aligned bounding box of this data set will be something like this so it is not that tight right <clears throat> but the OBB oriented bounding box will be a tighter one like this one so I, I should pr prefer this obviously so how do I compute it that products come into picture how do they come so once you find the principal directions of this data set which is the first direction is this and the second is orthogonal to that guy so basically I have this uh, better drawn green axis so what I do is I create and the origin is the mean of the data points which is this 0 0 so I create these vectors from the origin to each point and then I project them to my axis to this principal axis first so and take the length of these projections in other words take the dot product of this vector like this vector with the principal direction so this dot product will not be that high so it's not an interesting point for me for this direction but this dot product will be the highest so it will be my p max similarly this will be the lowest because it's negative and projected on this uh, vector it will be p, p main and similarly I use the second principal axis which is this and I do the dot products here so then this point is apparently important it determines my q max like in the second dimension there is another there is also another way to do this uh, it is not about our topic our it's not in our scope today but it is good to know I was impressed by this algorithm personally what they do is uh, <clears throat> this observation object oriented bonding box there are there is one more B here unfortunately or whatever OBB has a side collinear with one of the edges of the point says convex hull so convex hull we have seen this in the first class it comes again so thanks to this theorem <clears throat> so in this case the data set is the green points the convex hull is the green obviously and there may be other points as well but this is the uh, convex hull because these are also in my data <clears throat> set <clears throat> so let's count one two three four five six edges so i will draw six candidates uh, rectangles let's count one two three four five six yes correct uh, that are tangents to each of these uh, convex hull edges and then select the minimum area basically it is the idea there is also a pseudocode if you are willing to implement it or something but again it is not our topic uh, so PCA motivation let's get motivated about this business so it is a way to prevent curves of dimensionality uh, what do I mean by that uh, uh, my space uh, grows very quickly um, but the number of examples are the same so like what do I mean by that uh, assume you have a 20 by 20 bitmap <coughs> to draw digits on uh, it means that there will be this many dimensions because this will be 20 times 20 pixels and each one can take 0 or 1 on those axes so I will have 400 axis dimensions but to be honest most of them are redundant like there will never be an input like this no one will if it is not a pathetic person or real person he, he will or the computer will give this input to your digits related application true dimensionality is about how much variation I have been writing when I I have when I was writing a digit like this <clears throat> so we should use this lower dimension uh, not the higher one and what is the curse then uh, <clears throat> So if these are my data points like reds, green, and uh, blue, so 1D, I have three regions, low, medium, high, maybe. 
it is okay to separate them in 2D, let's do the same quantization, then I will have nine regions, but same nine points. In 3D, 27, and so it is growing exponentially, but I still have 10 points. Okay, so obviously most of the places in higher dimensions will, con will contain no observations at all, so they are totally redundant and it will complicate my processing. So PCA, let's understand how it works. Uh, I first compute center of mass of my endpoints, okay, and then translate the data point so that the origin, origin is at n. And so out of xi, I get this yi by subtracting mean. It's called demeaning, maybe it's also a cool word. Uh, so then all these <coughs> data points, if we are in 3 Ds, and then I will have 1, 2, 3, x, y, z here. Every column is one point, okay? So I have a D by N matrix. <clears throat> then I will compute the covariance matrix or scatter matrix S by this action. We will see how it works. So it will measure the variation of points in different directions. And then eigenvectors of S will give me the principal directions, basically. It's the roadmap is about doing some matrix multiplication and taking eigenvectors. Now let's understand the logic behind that. What is covariance first of all? Var variance uh, is its sister, it's the user version. It's represents the spread of the data points, right? And basically I have this mean average point and the, the difference of my data points from this point, is I can sum them up to get the variance. Basically this is the standard deviation the variance is the square, uh, so, so, so this is the standard deviation and variance <coughs> is the square of the standard deviation. So this is the variance. Uh, so let's focus on this normal distribution, a popular one. In that case, uh, almost 70% of the samples or observations will have value around mean. So if we stick with this PDF probability density function uh, and, and my random variable is about weight of a dog in kilogram so apparently 10 kilograms is an average weight so most of my dogs will be living in this region like 10 kilo, 11 kilogram, 12 maybe but fewer of them will be having 18 kilogram okay so then the variance here uh, is Variance and the mean is enough for me to capture this uh, the, vari the distribution of this data. <coughs> now the covariance, so the variance uh, is <coughs> okay for axis aligned directions like x and y, but sometimes, usually actually, the data comes uh, in weird formats like in this case. The variation is not only in one axis, so I need to look at other uh, combinations. So, for instance, in this case, when x, if x is increases, so does y, right? In this case, so it means that there is a positive co 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 covariance between the correlation between x and y is positive. So, the covariance of x, y will be positive in that case. And obviously it will be symmetric because if x increases so does y. It can also be understood as if y increases so does x. So, uh, <clears throat> so what's the intuition behind this computation? So basically covariance x, y. Covariance between two attributes is an indication where whether they change together or in opposite directions or whether they don't change at all. So in this case, for instance, the average x value, x is a random variable, okay, y is a random variable, average x value is zero. And my input the current sample has an x value of one. So there is a variation that's positive. For y, it is negative, unfortunately, 
because my y is decreasing the trend is like for the average is four but this particular y is below it so i have a negative y that's why i take these differences so when you multiply them i have a negative covariance for that particular sample point one three and i will do it for all the points okay for all the points and so x bar here is basically mean of x so i am just using different uh, sources to put these uh, screenshots so x and y are one take one point sample yes we discussed this i know it for this sample x is above average but y is below yeah so it looks like as x is growing y is decreasing if this pattern continues for all the all the uh, samples then i end up with a negative covariance between x and y okay um, <clears throat> so uh, uh, and basically some simplification we do is we put the mean of the point to the origin okay so this is the mean of these one two three four five six seven eight points it is in origin so this is zero and this is zero okay so now i can even i can make predictions uh, inferences even easier so all these green guys contribute positively because when x is above average which is zero so is x2 x1 and x2 so positive positive i have multiplication is a positive value and the amount of variation is the unit of this multiplication so here this red point x1 is negative because mean was here i am to the left of the mean but x2 is positive so i have a negative covariance etc so uh, since i put my origin to zero zero basically this is zero this is zero so it simplifies my life incredibly in 3d for instance i can use this for x x basically i take the sum of x times x right x i times x i okay for x y covariance i will take x times y x times y for all the points etc and the way to get this is using my initial y matrix remember i have this y matrix where every column is a data point and basically if you take transpose of y we know how to do it so what is happening here this guy is hit by this guy okay so it is going to be like uh, x from here and uh, so this is the x coordinate and this is the x coordinate i have x square for <coughs> for this sample i equal to one then for the next sample x coordinate is hit by another x coordinate so i2 is done right it is basically algebra if you are looking at the second dimension so i am dealing with this y coordinate here it is going to be hitting the x here so y times x i am accumulating them etc so okay just some covariance matrix i computed on some data here what you can see is this is zero right so it means that there is no variance between the that coordinates apparently every all the points are on a plane and here on this x y z points are coming from this plane right not that plane actually because in this plane z is very but in the plane that i am talking about is if this is my x and this is my y and this is my z then the plane that i'm talking about will be like this one there and so let me draw it clearly here so it is the xy plane right everything uh, it is plane xy plane but i can shift it to anywhere on this axis 
point is z coordinates of these points are not changing hence there is no variance on z there is some covariance on x y but there is no covariance on x and z etc anyway so this is the intuition about covariance now recall that uh, a covariance matrix S is important because it will give desired directions if I take their eigenvectors and eigenvalue, eigenvectors come with these eigenvalues they represent the variance along that particular eigenvector okay so it is the power of varying variance in, in, in other words in 3d if all the so in 3d I mean I have 3d points so my covariance matrix will be 3 by 3 it will produce three eigenvectors with three eigenvalues if all are all, all eigenvalues are the same it means that there is no particular direction right? every direction as good as the other one so then I am talking about spherical data set all the data is sampled on this sphere because this is maybe on principal direction you see but then the hell this is also principal but if I have one tiny eigenvalue like I sampled the points on this plane okay so this is x y and z so I have this plane so this is the I want to draw all of them so this is the first principal direction second one is still okay I have some variety in this but the third one is like the normal of this plane right it is from here uh, to the outside of the screen so I draw it like this but understand what I mean hopefully it's perpendicular to the others then then that one is the tiny eigenvalue so mm, uh, it gives it is an important information for me actually this is how we fit points to 3d data in 2d this is how we fit lines to 2d data because then in 2d if my points are like this <coughs> then <coughs> the uh, first eigenvector of the covariance matrix will be this okay it will be the direction but the second one will be perpendicular to this basically i will have two eigenvectors only in 2d uh, so the second one will be uh, the normal to that line and obviously sphere becomes circle in 2d so all the eigenvalues will be similar if your data points are like circle shaped <clears throat> so why do the eigenvectors of covariance matrix give the desired principal directions then okay why because take any vector okay so it is minus one one right minus one one you see this transform it with the covariance matrix i mean apply covariance matrices because this is what matrices do right after all you have a point and you apply an operator to it then voila, you transform this point to a new point okay so this is the idea of matrices right so apply as apparently i get the next point the next vector when uh, covariance matrix applied to it will be this i apply it again i get this it will be this applied again i get this so it is spinning not uniformly but it is spinning and in the end it converges it does not spin anymore it may scale if i now apply it again it will scale more but it will be here and <clears throat> turns out multiplying s spins the initial vector any vector towards the direction of the greatest variance so this is the intuition here so now that i know this uh, look for the vectors that don't get turned that don't change direction when multiplied by s so this is the definition of eigenvector eigenvector of a matrix is a vector that has not changed at all after the transformation m except by a scalar that scalar is eigenvalue so 
In other words, covariance matrix or any matrix times V, in the end, I end up with a, a, the same V, same direction V, but the scale of it may be different. So this is the definition of eigenvector. That's why I need to use the eigenvectors of my covariance matrix. And basically, PCA. <coughs> so for this point, I fr froze it here. Uh, principal direction is this, right? So the purple one, I should select it. So what is happening here? The variance is the biggest. So what is the variance? The variance is the spread of the red point. So it is now it's from here to here. It is very large, right? It was like from here to here, very big. But at this time, for instance, it is like this small. At this time, it is even tinier. Okay, so it does not capture good information, but the maximum variance occurs along the principal direction. It also turns out that it gives you the minimum error, but let's stick with the variance issue here. So by error I mean the following, the sum of all these red lines will be minimum. So let's see it here, it's still high, 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 and, and now it will be minimum if you sum them up. But again, stick with the variance, it's in the end. It is more useful for us. So, having learned the variation, synthesize the next shape. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so, basically, I will be just updating correlate semantic attributes to the existing data sets and then provide a new semantic attribute, a new value for that semantic attribute. And uh, I will get the corresponding shape. So I need to bind or uh, I need to find the mapping between semantic attributes and the PCA coordinates. I will find these directions and I tell basically I need to know how, how, how much should I go on those directions. So basically without any scanner or other device then I'll create my uh, new shapes by just providing keyboard inputs so let's do it then roadmap is here <coughs> I have this <coughs> data points from x1 to xn okay translate them so that the origin is at m Okay, so we, <coughs> mean shape is at the origin. Uh, so now let's go with the formation that I will use because now my data points will be my shapes. Okay, I will be many shapes, like 70 shapes. Okay, I will compute the mean shape by taking the average of corresponding vertices, etc. So I translate the shape so that the origin is at the mean, okay. So the mean sh shape is at the origin. So this matrix is now huge because every shape or every column here is a shape. Like in this shape, for instance, I have 12,500 vertices. Each vertex has three corners, X, Y, Z, right? So I will have 37,500, I guess entries in one column so the <coughs> size of this matrix is 3v times m it is huge okay but the idea is the same the roadmap is the same i will find the covariance matrix of uh, my data my y matrix i will find the covariance matrix of this uh, for this data uh, and then I will compute their eigenvectors. So I will show it how to do it, but the set of eigenvectors representing surface data in this manner is called the active shape model or statistical shape model. Okay, it is good to know some terminology. <clears throat> so basically, these are all my data points, the red guys. The mean shape will be in the center, okay, the origin, so 0, 0. And I will learn this P1 and P2, these cool axes, principal axes from PCA. And then uh, to get a new sample, basically, I start with the mean shape and then I will go in this variety B1 amount. Okay, so B1 is this, 
and then I will go in this variety B2 amounts, B2 is this, so basically I sample this new shape, okay, that is the idea. Uh, so how many directions should I use, if our data is like this, uh, like there is only one variation apparently, it looks like this case maybe, then uh, it's okay to go to even one dimension because uh, there is no collision, every data can be more or less represented with one attribute. So then start with the mean and go in this direction some amount to get your new sample point. Um, by the way, so there is an official number for this, not so official, but there is a good heuristic. How many dimensions should I use, right? Uh, so two or one or maybe ten, whatever. So remember every eigenvector com comes with an eigenvalue uh, so it gives the amount of variation, the power of variation so you sum them up so basically select the m largest eigenvectors start with the large ones obviously they are useful they have more information and sum their amounts of variations and when you hit 90%, it is enough because you captured 90% of variety in your data set. And you will be okay, believe me. Now let's do some algebraic tricks here because the y times y transpose is 3v times 3v. It is huge. Remember, v is like 1000, then I have 3000 times 3000. Matrix un unprocessable. Uh, and v is the number of vertices and 1000 is a very low number believe me so I will do this KLT this transform Carney law trick what is it? basically remember I will be using just a few eigenvectors m of them so I don't really need to compute all the eigenvectors here so let's go in this direction instead of computing the eigenvectors of s I will compute the eigenvectors of y, t, y. So what is it? This is a very nice matrix because y is 3v by n, right? I should have used the pen here, but whatever. And y transpose is n by 3v by some algebra nostalgia. So if I sum them up, the resulting matrix is the n by n. n is a very acceptable number n is basic number of samples okay like 70 when i am dealing with a data set of 70 uh, mesh models then denote pi the eigenvectors of the huge matrix and qi the eigenvectors of the small matrix so by definition this is the small matrix eigenvector when the matrix applies to it, I end up with the same direction with a different uh, scaling. It is the eigenvalue. Multiply both sides by a y. Okay. It is just, and I just switch places because this is a scalar value. So what do you see here? This is a matrix uh, being applied to a vector. This is a vector, right? Because qi <coughs> is basically a column vector. The result uh, is going to be uh, yeah, the, mm, the, the, let's write this better it will be so I am s switching to place of the scholar and the matrix which is doable right so uh, by QI hmm. okay so what happens here okay so don't, don't now say this but it will be clearer so this matrix is being applied to a vector called y times qi and the result is still in the same direction y times qi wonderful with some 
extra scalar in front of it. In other words, it is the eigenvector of this matrix. Wonderful. So I was looking for the eigenvector of this matrix anyway. Right? So pi is equal to the eigenvector that I'm looking for. It will be y times qi. And so finding qi is very easy because uh, qi is the eigenvector of a very small matrix. So it can be done. This is some trick that we do all the time. KLT. So, okay, PC gave me these principal directions P1 and P2. Now let's think it in shape domain. So this is a shape, okay. Obviously it's three-dimensional for the visualization, but actually this is 3V dimensional, like it's 3000 dimensional for me because this shape is defined by one point x y z second point x y z third point x y z so basically there will be one thousand dimensions so three thousand dimensions if you have one thousand vertices after the pca i will learn the variation variation successfully so i will learn these p1 and p2 the axis of the most variation and the second most variation and maybe third most etc so let's stick with two variations so this point, the same point x7, the seventh guy, is now represented by only two <clears throat> dimensions and uh, two coefficients on this 2D domain. So maybe this is the height, this is the weight. Uh, it's a semantic attribute. It is not a semantic attribute yet, it is just a number. My task is to uh, correlate those uh, numbers with semantic attributes okay so i have these numbers bi okay these are the uh, pca coefficients okay but i want to relate them to something that i know so like kilogram centimeter etc like height weight height etc so how do i do it i set a linear system like uh, I put all the coefficients to the B column vector and I put all the semantic so I manually tag them basically I tell them that the fifth man in my data set has 82 kilogram and 180 centimeters okay so I give this to the second the tenth man has a kilogram of 70 and he is a very short guy, he has 150 maybe or whatever. So you give these numbers to your system uh, and you compute one C correlation matrix for every guy, every model, and then you take average of all these C matrices and get this correlation matrix C prime or C underscore then when the user provides a new semantic attribute like create me a person who is 90 kilogram and 166 centimeter so it is probably a fat guy right whatever uh, then this c matrix will give me the b new coordinates the coefficients that will be useful on my principal axes okay that is the idea and by the way, I have used a linear mapping for the computation of C here. There are sophisticated models. Let me check that out. But I am giving the idea here. Linear model mostly works if your variety is not that uh, complicated. So, I know this B now, right? I learned this. So, this is, let's stick with this version. This is the expansion of the level. I know the B. And I know the principal axis by PCA. So it uh, basically, I am going to create a new shape, right? 90 kilo and 166 height. So the correlation matrix tells me two B values. B1 is 0 0.7, and B2 is minus 1.1 maybe. Then the mean shape, I know it, I go 0 0.7 in that uh, 
in that variety variation so the first variation is on the weight okay and then go minus one one in the uh, height variety okay so it is the idea then you get your new x so let me show you one little more example here assume that uh, p1 represents the variation in height okay it's consistent with me luckily p2 is weight so it is exactly doing this actually it is doing the opposite of this but anyway uh, so when 0 0 when the coefficients are found as 0 it means that no change to the mean so give me the mean shape and the equation is here right something times 0 is 0 so n plus 0 I will get the mean shape but let's do something different uh, I want the second dimension to go I want to go one unit in the second dimension so what was second dimension uh, weight so weight is like z coordinate right uh, the belly and height is about y coordinate so what is happening x nu is not stretched vertically because b nu is zero so basically this point will be hit by zero and or the second um, so every basically the points uh, here the this is the axis responsible for the height right because the first variation is the height so this will be whatever the values here they will all be hit by zero because p the first variation is given to, as zero so basically no variation about height will be applied so i will end up with the mean shapes height but these values this is about a different variation it is about uh, the fatness weight it they will be hit by a non-zero value so the resulting non-zero value will affect my mean shape this is the idea uh, so how do we get the mesh it is trivial actually because so far i compete the coordinates and uh, using the PCA coefficients and to get the corresponding shape uh, I have some kind of correspondence between these points uh, I probably have them as meshes in the in the first place so take the mean shape take, keep its connectivity so its topology and just update its coordinates to the computed new coordinates okay this is the idea so let me show you another application just to clarify this PCA based processing it will be a recognition task now not the generation so far we dealt with generation so recognition is about that uh, I want to recognize faces so this is my data set from here I will learn the variation the mean face etc and then given a new face I will recognize it I will say that this shape belongs to this guy etc so use eigen vectors in this context it is called eigen faces it's an old algorithm uh, to, so they represent images compactly with just three coefficients if you are using three eigen vectors in this case I am using three eigen vectors so in this case I have 14 images and every image is maybe 800 by 600 right so in terms of pixels I have thousands of pixels here so thousands thousands of dimensions but I am using three dimensions it is the cool part here to represent that image this is that guy this is that girl etc and apparently for that data set this is the mean shape and let's look at the first four eigenfaces or eigenvectors of the of this data set of the covariance matrix of this data set so what does this mean visually this is the first eigenvector or eigenface whatever it represents the most prominent deviations from the mean so it's a wonderful information so i have this mean shape if i apply uh, a big deal of this eigenface then this mean shape will go towards this shape 
because it is the variation. It is not an actual shape. It is not a mean shape. It is not that meaningful in that sense. So it is not a regular person, right? This is the second most prominent deviation from the mean. But the idea is you apply these variations to the mean shape and get a new face. So let me be clear. Uh, with only three principal components, so only one, two, three. With only three eigenfaces and with the correct weights, of course, you can go from mean to this guy, which is acceptable. But with 11, it is wonderful. It's perfect with 13, actually. Similarly, this guy, 11 is enough, 8 is acceptable, etc. So basically, in terms of recognition, so what am I doing? Uh, I am representing shapes with three coordinates, three coefficients. So when a new shape comes, I, I compute another three coordinates for that, and I compare it to these three, com to the closest, and I will find the closest x here, and I will assign it to that guy if it is close enough. It is, it is not, then I say that I couldn't recognize this face. Yeah, so that will be the end of the PCA-based shape creation. Now I will show you a different paradigm to generate shapes, and then you can go to the meshes of these shapes as well, using scanning or photogrammetry. Shape from stereo, so basically this X is, will be different each time I hit the uh, X line. This is a passive method. It requires two cameras, uh, two images of the real-world object with the object, and I will generate its digital mesh. So what is the idea? So if I have one camera, I have this pixel, and I know the calibration parameters. So everyone on this line, OP line, can be the projection of this pixel, right? So depth is ambiguous. I cannot. So given one image, I cannot tell you the 3D coordinate of this image because it can be the green guy, blue guy, red guy, etc. So what I will do is this trick. I will use a second camera and I will project this OP line to that camera and now it is called OP polar line. Or a fancy word for you. Then if I know the corresponding pixel to this P, assume that I know it now, then what is happening? I know the calibration parameters of this as well. I send array from this OR to this pixel, right? So this ray intersects this ray that already exists through this calibration. So the intersection of two lines give you the 3D points, which is the whole idea actually. Very nice. So the deal is, what is the corresponding pixel here? One people one thing people do is uh, uh, features so like histogram of gradient, surf or sift or whatever depending on the complication of your images so if you are in a controlled environment your features will be even less simpler uh, but these are generic features so the good news is I will so what is this by the way it is a 5x5 five five window around this P or 7x7 seven seven window it calculates a value by those averaging those pixels according to this uh, <clears throat> convolution windows, etc. Then I will use the same window on every pixel here, but not 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 every pixel. That is the trick. I will only look at the pixels on this epipolar line, so it increases efficiency also. It eliminates possible noises, like possible false false positives, right? Uh, still, I have, a, I may find uh, a bad correspondence. Then everything will be bad in the three D. But these features are robust enough. Yeah, so that is the idea. And in shape from structured light, so there will be. So this is a passive technique because you are not sending anything to the real world. You use the existing images. In this technique, you are sending structured light, uh, like a laser stripe. Okay. 
and then you are capturing the projection of this laser strap using two cameras. I will also show you using one camera version. But two camera is useful in this in the following sense. So the same logic. Uh, I have this point P. Okay. Uh, when I project it to one camera, it is this pixel here, uh, and I also know the stripe in this camera. Okay. So when you use a second camera, it captures a different look of the same stripe, of the, because we are living at the same time t. So the same logic. I have this epipolar line. It is the projection of this line uh, on this image, right? Then I intersect it with the laser stripe of the second camera. So I find the perfect correspondence to this pixel. Remember, I have done it using some features here. Still, they are supposedly robust, but still, there's um, there may always be issues. But this is a perfect way to solve this problem. Then, once you know this pixel, you send this ray, you intersect it with this ray, and you get your P. Okay, that is the idea. But the usual way of doing structured light is with one camera, it's cheaper, right? So, obviously, this is not original image, but you get the idea. Uh, one camera is capturing your uh, situation on the target object. So, now what do I need to do? I have two planes. This is the camera's image plane. Now, what is this plane? This pink plane is the sheet of the laser stripe. So, every laser point in that second must live in this plane. Then, Mapping from one plane to another plane uh, can be estimated with something called projective transformation. So I will not get into details because it's not division class, but I am giving the idea. So the, I need four correspondences basically, but in the end I can map any point here to a point here. And this is what I want actually. Uh, and you calibrate this once, it is the good news. You find this projected transformation once, and for the next slide, like I am moving this projector, laser projector here, then the camera moves a little back here automatically because they are coupled together. When I move this, it also moves, right? So you will do the uh, transformation parameters only once, and then given whatever 2D stripe here, you can send it to this 3D laser plane. And this is basically how you do the calibration once. You need four correspondences, right? So use a calibration object with uh, known points. And you know the projection of this point. So you, ne you know your four uh, correspondences. Another technique, shape from silhouette. Here, uh, it's a passive technique because you are not sending any ray. You are using existing images. Uh, not two of them, multiple of them, more than two probably. Uh, you send these binary silhouettes. Silhouette is like inside is white, one, and outside is black, zero. Uh, so the idea is intersect the back projections of the visual house. So these are called visual house. Okay, uh, intersect them. So it is a wake definition. Uh, I have done this in my own experience using some deformations, and I will talk about it. There are other ways to find this intersection, but how do I find the intersection? Uh, so start with a bonding sphere of the digital object. Okay, it's a very big sphere in the beginning. Then a 3D point on this sphere or along the way in, the, in an iteration is projected to all of the silhouettes so this is one silhouette okay if it's projects here uh, the environment of this is all black so it will give me black is zero and white is one right so it will give me a very small value out and uh, for in it will give me a positive value and for the boundary it will give me uh, 0 0.5 value, so I will show the details later. So, make the projection to all the slurs. If it is out in 
even one of the images, it means that it is out, right? So move the uh, sphere uh, vertex uh, in the opposite of the normal direction because initially I have this sphere, right? So it's out, move it, this is the normal direction, opposite, so shrink it, right? You are kind of shrinking it, taking the air inside of this balloon. balloon. Uh, if it is white, by the way, so I can overshoot, then I will do some binary circling here, back and forth, back and forth, until I hit the uh, gray pixel, like the boundary pixel. So how do I do it? Uh, in my code basically is as follows I take this point I project it to all the silhouettes okay all the images uh, and then this G function is an interpolation of the sub pixelic projection because this projection is not an integer so it may be a real number with some fractions and the alpha and beta is the fraction of x and y's so anyway, uh, G gives you the interpolation of the projection x prime y prime of this point and takes values in 0, 1 interval. 0, if everyone around is 0, right? So basically, right, th these numbers will all be 0 because you're, uh, so this is the right pixel, this is the left, sorry, this is the up, this is left. So you are looking at all these values and they all come zero because I intensity of a black pixel. So maybe you are here. It will give you zero, right? And when you take minus 0 0.5, it will be minus 0 0.5 for the out pixels. And even for the very out ones, like for far out. And when some, when all of them are like uh, one, you are totally inside then this projection will give you a value close to 1 but when you have a hybrid configuration sum is 0 sum is 1 like you are here then you get your cool 0 0.5 value <clears throat> yeah so that is the idea that I did in one paper uh, and the name of the paper is this by the way uh, so Let's do one last version here. Shape from silhouette and structured light all together. I fuse them together because each approach has disadvantages and advantages. Shape from silhouette, for instance, it has this hidden concavity problem. Remember, I am intersecting the back projection. So take this cube with a cavity. The pr projection of this cube is a square, right? From this side and from this side is a square. When you take the back projection of this I have a visual hole like a rectangular box another one and their intersection is a full cube where is the cavity so when you increase the number of uh, images you can make things better but this may be inevitable you see the concavity problem shape from structured light is concavity sensitive so it is good with concavities but it may have holes in it by the way, shape from slit doesn't have any hole, it's a good news. Why does it have a hole? Here it doesn't have a problem, but here it has a problem. Because the same stripe at this time t doesn't hit this part, so there is no data here. We have also seen this here, right? Hidden, uh, not hidden, sorry, uh, missing info. It is due to self-occlusion. So what I do is, in this paper, is fuse them like we first do shape from silhouette come here with a hole free nice mesh but there is a concavity problem then start with this good initialization and use the uh, cavity friendly concavity friendly uh, range data laser data with holes but I don't bother the holes because I already have hole free model from the silhouette yeah so that wraps it up actually shape from x business is also done with that as usual i leave you with some potential project topic alerts